presentation, we're going to see some seismic, and I'm going to make a statement right up front. I'm not a geophysicist. Were Kevin Thomas was a master's student, and he worked with the geophysicists to prepare those images. I'm a geographer and a driller of dry holes because I love to chase channels. And uh, fortunately, uh, the last few years, I've, I've been at Oklahoma State University, and I'm on the, I'm on the state payroll. And it's a lot less stressful, let me tell you for sure. But, this is, a, this is a master student project. It's mostly in Noble County. It gets a little bit over to the Osage. But the concepts we're talking about here are applicable probably anywhere. You have 3D seismic, and hopefully you can take something away uh, from the presentation. So the Red Fork, Red Fork slash Burbank, Lower Skinner, these are tremendous reservoirs in northern Oklahoma and southeastern Kansas, I'm going to call the Cherokee platform, and Red Fork itself extends off, off down into the Antarctica Basin, where they're, we're working still. And some of these are really great reservoirs, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples from Payne County, where we have 80-acre tracks that will produce over 400,000 barrels of oil from inside the valleys. <coughs> And, but it's very rare to see what we see in this particular area in Mobile County, which most of the presentation is about. So let's talk about some of the goodies. Uh, this is uh, right on the east side of Stillwater. That blue line, those two semi-parallel blue lines and the kind of whatever color, but another magenta, whatever those other colors are, those are valleys, eroded valleys. And for scale, maybe some of you can't see it, this is a section. So this valley is less than one half mile wide. And it's an interesting valley because it does two things. It has sandstone in it by its own right, but it also serves as a seal for a large area of thin Skinner sandstone, which is known as the low, uh, Stillwater Lower Skinner Sandstone Unit. So I'm going to back up with this. Those blue lines going up through there serve as a track for all of these little yellow wells you see over to the west. And for a long time, Apache was pumping in water in the water flood over here to the west of that valley. And there was one well sitting over here in the valley and you can watch that production curve and it just follows the, in, the injection rate of water. So it's a leaky seal and part of that water was leaking into the valley and helping out one of the wells in the valley. Unfortunately, there, they shut down the unit except for just a couple of wells that still produce over there. The unit's mostly all plugged out, abandoned. Uh, we don't have that benefit of helping out the wells in the valley. but. I'm not going to go into why we call it a valley, but just to, I'll give you one clue here. This is the pink limestone, outlined with red. And you will see in this case, this particular valley cut down to the top of the pink. And in the case that we're going to show you in just a minute, it cuts all the way through the pink and into the top of the red forest. So here's another example. Oh, there's the cross section through that valley had a common oil water contact in the valley, and in some cases you just have a few feet above water, in some cases you have 20 feet above water, and this one lease, this one 80 acre lease on the southeast edge of Stillwater, Oklahoma, has produced 846,000 barrels from two wells. Naturally flooded, the water underneath. There's no way you can engineer that much oil into that reservoir, but it's produced it. So here's another one out east of town uh, called Sooner Valley. The valley is outlined in the black hash marks. Within that valley, there's heterogeneity. The blue represents a somewhat common reservoir that runs right up through here. This is another reservoir. It's still in the valley, but it's separated. How do we know that? Well, we have oil. Then we have a gas well right here in the middle. Then we go back to oil. And we have gas and oil here down dip from water within the same valley. So there's a lot of heterogeneity within those valleys. 
uh, Dr. Gary Stewart, who some of you know, said, he said, think about it this way. He said, you take some uh, garden hoses and lay them in a, a gutter, close your eyes, someone brings you over there with an ice pick, see how many of them you can hit and you don't know where the gutter is. And that's kind of what we're doing. This is one hose lying over in this side of the valley, and here's another hose lying over there. If we look at a cross section through this particular valley, we see a similar relationship. This is a structural cross section, by the way, and you'll see the gas down dip from water and oil, all in the same section. But this particular this particular lease has been updated. Uh, let me see if I update it on here. This area of production over to the, in this valley. This, these two wells here are now up over 581,000 barrels of oil. And one of the later wells drilled in the field was drilled right down here, and it showed the depletion effect from that production up to the northeast. So that's, that's one reason we like to chase it. Now, some of the questions and objectives from this particular project were, uh, why would a valley in the lower center align itself along right over the top of a valley in the red forest. Because normally, when you look at the big picture, these sediment dispersal systems, the red fork was deposited to the west of the Bartlesville. There's a reason for that, because the Bartlesville deposition poured all that sediment in there and you, you took up the accommodation. There's no space for the red fork to deposit there. It shifted to the west. After Red Fork was deposited, the Skinner shifted back to the east. So the bottom line here and what we're wanting to achieve by integrating 3D seismic and wireline log data, we're getting hopefully the evidence to support the hypothesis that Kevin proposed in his thesis. So this, these are a couple of maps that you'll see over and over. The Red Fork system is on the left panel. The Skinner system is on the right panel. And these are the major feeder channels or valleys in the, uh, in the lower Skinner. And over on the Red Fork, we come out of this fluvial complex. We come to the shelf edge. And then finally, we have some shallow marine sandstones. And then we have basin floor submarine fans in the Red Fork out in the Antarctic Basin. But the reason I'm showing you this particular slide is to demonstrate how the Skinner stayed to the east of the Red Fork. But in the example we'll look at, you're going to see two valleys, one in the Red Fork and one in the Skinner, and they're right on top of each other. So here's the study area, outlined in red. It's over there close to the Big Bend, or includes the Big Bend. On the Osage side, it goes into Noble and parts of Pawnee County. A section of a wireline log on the left, and some of the seismic, or section of a seismic profile on the right. And the Mississippian, Pennsylvanian contact, is a great, I guess you could say, a great change in velocity, and that's pretty easy to pick. <laughs> The vertigree and Oswego carbonates and changes in mythology are pretty easy reflectors to pick. When you get into the lower Skinner and Red Fork, you can't really, based on this work, you, you couldn't resolve those two. But right where you see that label, uh, there's something going on in this particular uh, seismic section. This is what uh, Kevin called Mississippi Chat. He called Mississippi Chat anything that had a really clean gamma ray, really robust ballooning SP, and that very low resistivity, less than two or three ohms, ohm meters. Um, with my limited experience with the Chat, what really makes you curse the Chat is you'll drill some of these, they'll have beautiful shows in them. Then you perforate them and you can't get anything out of them. So you frack it and you know what you have to. You frack it, you get the ocean. That seems to be the old vertical approach to the chat. Now, Shane 
has, has things which have a lot more than I have. We used to avoid it unless it was on structure. If you're on structure, you had half of a chance. So I worked for a company that cursed the chat, except in a few instances when it was very good to us. And when it's good to you, it is really good to you. Okay, so let's look at the let's look at the Red Fork dispersal system again. You can see all these channels in the in the uh, Red Fork interval. Here's our scanner, here's our scanner map again. We have some of the some of the valleys on there. And this, I wish I could say I made all this, did all this work, but you can, I mean, look at the people that whose work we relied on to pull this little map together. Okay, so uh, here's the here's the, the nine township block. Um, Kevin used over 2,300 wire line logs in this area, and then they had a, a 3D seismic that covers about two thirds of the western part of this study area. And this is just a Petra Geographics built structural contour map. Uh, 50 foot contours uh, using the, the pink limestone. There's 843 data points used to make this map. And you can see some of the big structures, maybe Masham and Watchhorn in here in, in Pawnee County. But just a nice uniform dip for the most part off towards the west. Important thing is we're still far enough east of the Nemaha uplift for not seeing that complex geology associated with the Nemaha uplift. And uh, he also contoured, uh, again, this is a 50-foot contour interval, 639 data points of the uh, Pennsylvania-Mississippi contact and going out of Pennsylvania shale into either what well, he called Mississippi Chad or Mississippi Solid if there were no intervals there that had the characteristics as what he called Chad. And again, this nice uh, uniform dip, except for those big structures, and, and they, they show up nicely when you use a 50-foot contour. Okay, this is, <coughs> this is one of those uh, channels. This is the Lower Skinner Channel. It's less than a mile wide in the Los There were quite a few wells in here. He's just not showing them on his map. And it skirts the, skirts the Arkansas River, runs basically north to, to southeast, right, right east of Sooner Lake, between Sooner Lake and the river. When we look at a cross section, well, we'll get there eventually. Here, the, here is a, here's a map where the pink limestone, which should be sitting beneath the lower skinner, is absent. And the pinks are a fairly reliable marker, lithostratigraphic marker out here. So it's, a, it's an easy thing to pick. And in these, uh, in these areas, it's missing. Now the pink just doesn't disappear on a limb. If it was uh, lithified material before the Lower Skinner uh, Valley formed, and eroded through it, and we're going to get to it. And here's the, here's the Red Fork. Okay, picture where the Red Fork is. And here's uh, here's Center Lake, and there's the there's the river. This thing is running right over the top of it. This just does not typically happen in the systems that we study. So the big question is why. And here's a here's a log cross section. You can see here's our here's our lower skinner. This is where the paint should be. It's been removed in this particular area. Here's sand on sand, sand on shale on sand there. And it can be very confusing looking at the wireline logs. Where does the lower skinner stop and where does the red fork begin? But if you can see the rock, you can tell the difference between the two. And if you've seen the rock, and then I'm going to give you what works here. This may not work four miles away. But in this particular case, and also in the case of the Stillwater field, you'll notice that uh, an SP on that lower Skinner sandstone is not quite as robust as it is for the uh, Red Fork. This is, works in at least two fields. 
I don't know if it works everywhere else in northern Oklahoma. You just about have to see the rock. And you know what my next mine is going to be? Cut all the core you can, okay? So, Because we need that rock to look at. Trying to convince engineers to cut cores would be really difficult unless you tell them to do it with impermeability measurements. Okay, I'm biased. We love core. OSU is going to dedicate to Gary S. Stewart Core Lab this Saturday. We have a new we have a new building. It's not a great big building, but we're all set up to look at more core. And uh, I know Mike will be there. Bill, are you coming over? I'd like to. Saturday. Saturday. I'm going to talk ahead of the ahead of the OSU KU guy. Les Miles is coming back to Stillwater. I'll be coming back to He is. He didn't hear me say that. Anyway, he's a good coach. You have him motivated. Okay, so uh, anyway, we have, we're having new facilities and look at core, cut rocks, and do all the things that lay out core that you know, in the past several years we've been doing it always. Okay, so this is uh, the thickness between, uh, this is map thickness using well logs between the paint and the Mississippi. It demonstrates that that interval was thickening off to the west like we would expect it to. Again, we're not being influenced yet by uh, the Nemoha upgrade. And here's an area where uh, Kevin identified what he's calling Mississippi Chat and you get this nice east-west trend across the northern part of his study area. So uh, a cross-section that's flattened on the Woodford. It's kind of interesting. Uh, again, not a, not a chat person, but here you see what he called chat over a thin Mississippian. Over here, the frosty is not quite as good. Up here is another, what we call chat, over very thick Mississippian. And I really appreciate Lloyd Gatewood's remark about the Arbuckle being the most misunderstood reservoir. And that's because he didn't work chat. <laughs> he would have probably said they're tied. <laughs> but uh, Lloyd Gatewood's work is, is remarkable on the, on the Arbuckle. Okay, so this is what the lower part of the section looks like. Now, this is uh, travel time for the Mississippian horizon. And yeah, this is, uh, you can see areas where it's thin, where it's deeper up to the north. And it's, uh, it's nothing really stands out at you when you look at this, uh, look at this map. But when you start to, look at some of the attributes and you start to make a 3D image, all of a sudden, now up to the north is, is where we see all the chat. But down to the south, we this really long linear feature, this liniment, started showing up on the top of the Mississippian at that Mississippian Pennsylvania contact. And this is a thickness based on time between the vertebrae and the top of the Mississippian. And when you start to look at that thickness, then you start to see it show up, it's starting to show up as well along that same, same trend. And I realize they're both part of the seismic processing, so they should, it should be, you see some relationship there. But still, this is a very unusual trend from what we normally see in northern Oklahoma. And here again are the two previous figures, B and C down at the bottom. And when you look at the seismic profile, where the arrow is pointing to is that square red fork arrow. There's some type of a seismic anomaly there. But down below, you start to see these reflectors at least bent down, or if not breaking up, <coughs> below, that, below that feature. 
Again, here's another cross section across that, that, that northeast to southwest linear trend. And a, a side of the profile, this is DD prime down south. And you start to see something up here that almost almost looks like a half robin where it might maybe it's faulted on one side and folded down on the other. So, oh, forgot we had another one in there. Again, similar results. Something is going on at the top of that Mississippi and that blue line of the Mississippi and Pennsylvania contact immediately beneath where you see this red blob, which I guess blob's not too technical of a term. This red marked reflection, whatever, in the seismic that corresponds to the Skinner and the Red Fork. I mapped in this area 40 years ago, and I saw this linear trend, and I saw where you had shale on both sides, and all of a sudden you had this really thick interval of sandstone in the Skinner Red Fork. And for the life of me, I couldn't explain it. And you couldn't map it back then when I was working it because there weren't enough wells drilled through there. And there were a lot of wells drilled subsequent to the time that I worked it. But, okay, this is called similarity. This is an attribute map. Uh, similarity is kind of a generic term. Sometimes you'll hear the word coherence. Uh, coherence is a copyrighted term, I believe. So we're using similarity. And uh, why areas have very similar type seismic characteristics, and then where you start to see the purple is where things aren't so similar next to each other. And again, you start to pick up this linear trend down in 2023 that runs northwest to southeast. And then the spectral decomposition which please don't ask me what that means. But they went through several different uh, cycles, frequency cycles, to see. They used, my understanding is that the, they used different frequency cycles to try to extract out different thicknesses. So anyway, here you see the 8 hertz, 28, 8.8 hertz, and the 80 hertz. And you still see this very linear feature. So, the purple oval on the left uh, is over the uh, thickness map that uh, Kevin uh, contoured, uh, and it corresponds to the yellow oval over the, the seismic image on the right. And so what, we, what we're seeing here is we're seeing these sand bodies, the King sandstones, directly overlying this linear feature. And here's the one, uh, again, the ovals are in the exact same positions. Seismic data to the right, hand contoured uh, data from well logs to the left. And a reminder, again, this is one of those, one of those seismic sections that in this, and in this case, someone had enough further to go ahead and draw a potential fault that cuts across that deeper paleozoic section and goes down into the basement. So, what we observe is that these linear <coughs> sandstone trends, for both the Red Fork and Lower Skinner, overlie this feature that we can see on the Mississippian surface. Based on what we know right now, it looks like it might either be a grobin with two faults, or maybe it's only a half grobin. The interesting thing about it is though that it affected the section so many feet above the top of the Mississippian. And what we believe is that, remember, there were in these depositional cycles in the Pennsylvania. So these depositional cycles have a low stand portion of the cycle where sea level is dropped due to accumulation of ice in Gondwana down around the Antarctica of today. 
And then when that ice melts, sea level rises, and these valleys fill up with sediment, and eventually sea level will rise to the point where you get the black shales, core shales, and carbonates that were associated with flooding of the area. But we believe that this these faults remain active in through the through Lindfork time and into lower Skinner time, and possibly generated just a very subtle topographic flow at that time. And the erosion during those two depositional cycles exploited that low, focused, the water was focused down that trough, and there was, those are the reasons that those two valleys were eroded where they are. And this fault movement, if that's what it is, lasted through <coughs> time, lower Skinner time, but by the time you get up to the vertigree, or up to the Oswego time, there's no evidence of it. Now what is interesting, that would probably coincide roughly time-wise with about the time that some of the structures along the Nemoha were covered with Pennsylvania deposition. And this is the, this is the takeaway. If 3D science can delineate these type of features, and maybe the, in this case the control of some of these narrow channels. We know that 3D seismic can image valleys. It's been, it's been a very successful technique to prospect for, for oil and gas, just imaging the valleys themselves. But if you have sandstone accumulations in the valleys that maybe are too thin to image, but you can, dis you can discern or detect maybe something on the surface below that might be contributing to the distribution of those valleys, then you've gained another tool, another bit of evidence to prospect with. And obviously, now I'm going to promote sizing. Cores and sizing. These ideas work. And uh, in the, at the time we did this, an ideal place to see 3D seismic is over the Sarah Field in Noble County. It exists. It's out this depth and seismic. And the influence of Mississippian paleotopography on sandstone distribution in the Marwan in western Kansas is well documented in eastern Colorado. And the question is, how many of these narrow channels, you know, 40 acres wide, maybe a half mile wide, like the Stillwater Channel, how many of them are out there snaking their way through the subsurface and, and we just can't see them? Using, uh, using the subsurface data, the mapping data from well logs. So, thank you for attending. I'm through. It's going to be happy hour here in a minute, yeah. which I, I don't get the benefit of because I have to turn around. I teach at 6.30 tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> turn around. Hey, still oh, I'm sick. <laughs> but I'll, well, I'll take any questions. Uh, please, go ahead. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, this channel that you identified, you and others, uh, do you know of uh, other ones in, in, in Oklahoma that are similar? Uh, not where we have the two overlying each other. We, ha we can isolate the, the Lower Skinner channels, and that's Lower Skinner and Upper Skinner channels are two that I chased with great gusto decades ago. And uh, certainly, Certainly, they are out there. Uh, the Red Fork channels, when you get out of uh, this very wide Red Fork fairway that we see that goes up through Burbank Field, when you get to the west of the Nemaha Ridge, uh, 3D seismic has been very successful in, in both locating those Red Fork channels in western Oklahoma. But yes, they're out there. And uh, they, can be, they can be very difficult to chase. Uh, <laughs> testify to that personally. Does the absence of the peak line marker that's so prevalent, uh, is that the indication that could be? Absolutely. There are some cases where probably because of petty topography the pink was not deposited, but over most of northern Oklahoma it's, a, it's an exceptional lithostratigraphic marker. And the same thing goes for the vertebrae limestone too. There are cases where uh, where the crew channel 
cuts down through the vertebrae, down into the spinner interval, and in eastern Oklahoma, I've seen crude sandstone erroneously called skinner sandstone because they didn't notice that the vertebrae limestone was missing. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've seen that blue chin cut all the way through the paint. That's amazing. It looks it? like it. Yeah. The paint's missing. Yeah. And I think it runs from Kansas City down to Texas. There's no limit. This kid, this sounds like an obsolete one I saw out in uh, somewhere close to Indians, I forget where it was, but it was a channel. Yeah. What kind of reserves was in that channel? You know, that's a good question. There was a little bit of production. The best way to produce these things is just get them draped over, these hoses draped over a nosing. And, uh, but I meant to pull the production. There was some production. It was, it wasn't, uh, wasn't, I can't remember. It wasn't, it wasn't the 400,000 or 800,000 barrels like you see in these Payne County channels. It was okay at it's the like time. Three to, three to eight, 8,000 barrels per well. Yeah, so I mean, it wasn't that. Three to eight. Yeah, you know, that little cluster of wells. I know they drilled quite a few wells and they're trying to find it, but it's not over a nosing. If you get a <coughs> over a nosing or, or an incline, it, uh, they're fantastic. <coughs> and so my, my suggestion is those areas of in and northern Oklahoma that haven't been covered with 3D seismic, they need to be shot and people need to just pick the seismic apart and try to find these these new channels. Well, he's he's right. right. If we're talking three to eight thousand barrels, that's not economical. No. Were they looking for uh, something deeper? Uh, you know, I don't. Just have, you all just happen to come across this. You know, I don't. I mean, why would you drill? You would drill wells for three to eight thousand barrels. Well, you know, I don't. I don't know the history of that development. It's uh, in that trend. There's a couple that make two hundred thousand. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones we're really on top of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that right there, yeah. 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 Yeah, that, that area right there is, is no, the, the scanner's a little scanner. <coughs> you, you come down into Payne County, and sometimes you'll get a nosing that'll only have two good wells on it, but they'll produce half a meter of the well. And you can try to offset it all around it. Bunch of dry holes surrounding <laughs> That's right. That's, that's, uh, one of my mentors told me every good oil field is defined by dry holes. Well, yeah. Yes, Shane. So, can is this thesis that this uh, young man did available? It's not available yet. Okay. They had a two-year moratorium on the lease. When did that begin? Probably last. Oh, I'm going to guess probably December 18. Okay. That's what I think. That's great. Great work in the fall. Yeah. yeah. So, you. Uh, or we'd like to see more people pour their well. Absolutely. Maybe the university could uh, contribute, you know. Oh, man. Uh, Have you been trying to get money out of the university? You want drugs, Paul. I know you had planned on pouring that, but, you know, the university works. The shipboard will buy a whole bunch of them. Who can, you know, let me get around and do the check change? Yeah. So that's like trying to convince my wife to take a working interest in a well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the Osage have uh, multiple large 3D seismic volumes uh, that Chevron acquired back in, in the late 90s, as well as some others. D does OSU have, uh, do you all have? No, to my knowledge, we do not. I mean, I'm, again, I'd have to talk to some of our geophysicists, but I have, I've heard nobody but talk. But would, I would encourage you to visit with yeah. them and do the same sort of approach. Yeah, that would make some great learn that anybody's looked for. You know, we know we can see the fur bank in some of them. Yeah. But some of the skinnier channels are going to get this truck this year. Maybe find some little closures on some chat. Yeah. Maybe while we're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I bet someone's been looking for those already, though. <laughs> Not so much the channels. The channel, that, that, that what you just did, it, that's new for, you know, really in the last six, about six years. Yeah, so it's, um, the, uh, the one out east of town, the Sooner Valley was done so well, I mean, that was found by accident. 
there's a little Iowa high there, and they were jumping for the real cops, and they didn't find the real cops for that, but they just dumped them into that, to that channel. Then they said, look how smart we are. And I said, you, yeah. are. you got a well drill. And then you won't find a well without drilling wells. You have to drill wells. And unfortunately, the climate up here is not very conducive for drilling wells right now. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. One quick one. Uh, what uh, sample descriptions? <coughs> you talked about cores, and you can tell the difference between the uh, yeah, what was it? The Skinner? Yeah, the Skinner the Red Fork. What, what is it? What is the sample description of those two samples? Typically, the Skinner in the valleys and in the portion of the rain. But the real, the real diagnostic feature is that the siltstone at the top of the Red Fork is there. There's a greenish gray siltstone. It actually, right on top of it, it's an old exposure surface where soil is formed. That siltstone is unmistakable. And those, those that have looked at cuttings know exactly what I'm talking about before you start getting into the Red Fork sandstone. So if, you, if, you, if you're drilling sandstone and you think you have Skinner, and then you hit that siltstone, green, gray siltstone at the top of the Red Fork, you know. So now you know you're in the You know you're in the But in the valley itself, the lower Skinner is typically just a little bit of coarser ground. <coughs> Okay, so then below the red fork would be the bottle bill, I presume. Yeah, over here we don't have bottles in this, this particular area. Now to the south of here there are some bottles, but it has to get down in uh, low area. Because uh, right. our previous presentation on the uh, preserve we talked about the red fork, uh so about the bottles bill and having uh, vertical fractures where they yeah. communicated. And surely there's some identifying sample description between the red board, the basal red board. Yeah, I, I, I have it. That would be a tough one for me. But, but over here, we <coughs> seem to have that thinner uh, uh, Pennsylvania interval that we see in the western Osage and the Pawnee and that came into Bay County. So we have Skinner and we have Red we have to move south and back to the east to get a little thicker interval where the models go. You know, further east and southeastern Osage County, I have some red pork production. In, uh, right on top of our red pork, we have a, like a two or three foot streak of coal, uh -huh. which is a pretty good identifier. Yeah. Too. And that pork is kind of weird, too. That coal is fresh water. Even at that depth? Yes. And, yeah. and I'm talking about you that would be, because I've actually fracked into it. And why am I getting fresh water with cooler temperatures and fracking that, that little marker, that little yeah. cold soup? Yeah, as you go eastward, as, as those of you who are subsurface all know, that section starts to expand out and go into what we call the Cherokee Basin. And uh, those cold starts to you know, They're wonderful. Modern well ones are very easy to pick. So they help us with our too. Mike, no questions, please. <laughs> Mums? Uh, the only thing I would refer to is in southeastern Kansas, there are liniments, basement involved liniments, and the Bartlesville channel will follow <coughs> straight as an arrow. But I have never seen sands stacked like what you're talking about. So looking for the liniments. All right, any further questions? Well, thank you for sticking around.